in regions of Ethiopia, radical Islamist groups try to remove Christians. Sean Patton says the radicals don't necessarily have to kill Christians to achieve their goal. They have been targeting Christians, and these have been systematic. They've th- Their goal is to drive them out. And the way they do that is they usually destroy the church, they usually destroy uh, the Christian's home, and then they destroy the Christian's business. Oftentimes, Christians are killed in the attacks, but even if they're not, their ability to stay there and to have a livelihood and a presence becomes very difficult. And so, you know, our response is always immediately meeting those um, those emergency needs, but then we try to help them get back, to rebuild their homes, to rebuild their churches, to rebuild their businesses. And that's who we are as VOM, is helping rebuild their Christian witness so they can stay in those areas and continue to minister to their persecutors. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help, right now on The Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Welcome again to The Voice of the Martyrs Radio. My name is Todd Nettleton. We are in the studio today with two of our regional leaders here at The Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, Between the two of them, they oversee all of our work on the continent of Africa, Sean Patton has been with us before. He is the regional leader for North and East Africa. Jeremy Malkin is the regional leader for West and Central Africa. Gentlemen, welcome to VOM Radio. Thanks, Todd. Thanks. Jeremy, I want to start with you because uh, you have just returned from a trip to Central African Republic. It's a complex situation there as we talk about persecution and who are the persecutors and how are the Christians being targeted. Uh, what did you find on the ground as as you were just there? You know, it is a very complex situation. It's still a country in complete uh, crisis, I guess you could say. It's, you know, two-thirds of the country is controlled by rebel groups. Um, so the federal government has little authority outside the capital. You have a large UN peacekeeping presence, and you're in one of the least developed countries in the world. So even travel within the country to visit some of these areas where there is a lot of persecution can be pretty difficult. And what happens is when you visit these communities of Christians, because of the difficulty of travel, because of basically civil war, which ignited in 2011, they feel they're completely isolated. They're they're disconnected from the outside world and even from the capital city. So the ability to to reach them, to get them resources and all that becomes quite a challenge. On this recent trip, Right now, our focus has been more in the north and central parts of the country. And, you know, just to give you an example of what the situation looks like, I visited one town specifically in the central part of the country uh, where there were 58,000 refugees, all of whom identified as Christian. Now, I would say 30, well, it was reported by local pastors that 33,000 of those 58 were practicing Christians, regular church attenders or very, you know, more active in their faith. But the entire group identified as Christian, that made up the entire refugee camp. It was only the non-Christians, pre- predominantly Muslims, who, who were spared the conflict, the attacks that, that this community had faced over and over again. So these 58,000 refugees, some of them are coming from outside the town. They come to the town because that's where the, the UN presence is, which is really their only hope of physical protection mm-hmm. because they're they're just completely vulnerable in their home villages. And so within a hundred kilometer radius of this town, they said every single church had been destroyed. And not only churches, I mean, a lot of their homes, especially homes of uh, church leaders, pastors and, and their families. So they come to this community and they, they have just been attacked I mean, there's been one attack after another. Initially, they they kind of set up camp by the airstrip. I mean, thousands and tens of thousands of people. And in 2016, that camp was over overrun, completely wiped out. And despite a UN presence wow. being being right there by the airstrip, which is why they settled there, they were even forced to go further into town, into the the main area of town. So you you drive from the airstrip to the town which is just several miles of road, but and all you see are burned out and destroyed churches, 
homes, businesses, and vehicles. Now you have 58,000 people that are trying to settle. They're still, the rebels are still shooting into the camp at night. They have very little protection. Their means of livelihood in a normal life when they're in their villages would be farming. Right. And so sometimes they send people outside the town to tend their farms because within the camp, it's so densely pop- right. populated, you can't grow anything. And so just a week before we got there, it was reported that 14 women had been killed just outside of town tending their farm. So the the violence, just the suffering of the the Christian community in that area. Are they intense? Are they just sleeping out in the open? Do they have like a tarp over them? What what's their even their living condition? Yeah, a lot of tents. So you have some UN response where you have kind of the the what we would picture as you know refugee tents. Some are a little more established where they built a mud brick mm-hmm. structure with a hatched roof, but it's. It, it's that type of setting. I mean, I mean, it's it's a dirt floor and and a, a single bedroom that several families will will share. And it, you know, it's it's interesting too because you understand the culture of the Central Africans. And in a village setting, you know, the village chief would be the most respected. And and going down the line, you have more predominant families within that that culture. Once that village is is attacked and overrun. They end up in a refugee camp where the village chief may have the the most lowliest of I mean, sometimes, you know, just a a few blankets to string together over over some tree branches or whatever they wow. you know, just any so type just of shelter their whatsoever. Whole, their whole culture upside down. It, really. it really does. And most of them flee their villages with nothing more but the clothes on their back. So what's the response when when you show up and say I've come from Christians in America. We want to help you. Because we'll, we'll, it seems like they don't get a lot of visitors. No, they don't. And and they're obviously, I mean, of course, very receptive to that. One, it's just an encouragement knowing that the church is praying for them mm-hmm. in America and around the world because they do not get a lot of visitors and very few Christian visitors. You know, there there are other NGOs and UN forces, but but never those coming from the from the church and just saying, hey, we we want to pray for for you. We want to hear your stories. We want to we're we're here with you as brothers and sisters in Christ. So that's always encouraging. I I think there's a little um, skepticism when we first show up. If you know if if there actually will be a response right. because they hear things and then there there's a lot of time not any follow through. But it's it's been really exciting, especially the last couple of years as we've been able to visit these new areas, we kind of have this this multifaceted approach where just just meeting different different needs through different ministry partners, different local churches. One of those, one of the biggest requests that we get when visiting these villages are for Bibles. Because when the rebels come in, they destroy everything and including their Bibles. And it's interesting when people don't have food to eat or a roof over their head and their first request is for God's word. Through partnerships, we're able to provide everybody with the Bible, meeting kind of the the spiritual needs of through the local churches. There, uh, we've been providing trauma ministry because there there's so much trauma, and that's something that's that's not typically done in Africa. Um, but we want biblical trauma based care for those who need it. Education for kids. I mean, when they flee to these refugee camps, they sit there for years and they lose any opportunity that they had for education. So working with local schools, whether they're UN run, government run, uh, whatever the uh, uh, just, you know, existing schools in the community, what what capacity do, do existing schools have? And are there teachers among the displaced? How do we employ them to teach their own kids? What what churches will open their doors to be used as classrooms throughout the week? Those are the types of questions that we have with the local community. And then just more of a relief type response where we're trying to meet their basic needs, blankets, tarps, pots and pans for cooking, uh, tools for, for farming, seeds, whatever they can do. That's been our approach, but it's been really exciting. And with the Bibles, you know, it, it, that includes audio Bibles. It includes children's Bibles that we've been working on to translate into local languages. It's been a real encouragement to the church on the ground to Good. to, to see VON's response in that in that regard. With regard to the the situation in CAR, is there any sign of it stabilizing? Is there any sign that these people will be able to go back to their villages, or or is this 
sort of limbo situation that they're in, is that just like indefinite as far as the eye can see? You know, it depends on, I mean, those are the questions we're asking every <laughs> time we visit. Is anybody returning? And depending on the the region and area of the country, in some cases, there are people returning. Um, in places in the southeast where VOM has been engaged since 2017, people are starting to go back. So what does that look like? Now we're talking about their homes were destroyed, right. their farms. It's, it's kind of starting that, completely from scratch. It is. It is. Um, but in other areas, like this town that I'm in, mentioning in the central part of the country, uh, when they try to go outside the town, these 14 women killed. were killed. So, no, there is no hope at this point of them going back. And the Civil War has been going on now 10 years. Since 2011. Wow. When the uh, the Selica formed in the north, a coalition of uh, Muslim rebel groups took over the government in early 2012. And then since that time, it's been transitional periods. There have been elections, but it, it's been very much dependent upon the international community and the UN to to govern. So that won't change anytime soon, unfortunately. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Sean Patton and Jeremy Malkin. They oversee our work on the continent of Africa. Jeremy, when you go and sit down with a pastor in, in a situation like that, so this pastor's living in a tent, his congregation is is tens of thousands of displaced people also living in tents. What do you say to him or, or, or what do you what do you try to leave him with mm. to say, hey, what you're doing is really important and we love you and we're standing with you, but also I'm about to get on a plane and leave and, and yeah. you're still going to be here. Yeah. I mean, that that's hard. I mean, we pray for the right scriptures in the moment and um, knowing that we we are so fortunate because we we are coming home you know and they're staying and praying with them telling them that as as alone as they feel there are people that that will hear their stories and know what they're going through and surprisingly that's a greater encouragement to them than than I think us westerners realize because they don't hear that and they do feel completely isolated and just that reminder that we are all in the same family, the body of Christ, um, that he is my brother, um, that we need to support and care for one another as as we see in the scriptures, as Jesus taught us. And, and um, really the hope that this isn't the end. There, right. this, this world is not our home. Um, we live for something greater, that which we can't see now, but but there is a, a, a greater kingdom to come that that we will that we will realize in yeah. in God's presence and and um and telling him that look it is it is your faith that gives us as believers boldness in the west um your perseverance the church and the CAR what you are suffering through is an encouragement to us and and strengthens our faith and we hope to live as as you exemplify and uh for that for that eternal kingdom as well so we want to equip our listeners to pray, and I think we'll, as we hit different countries, we'll just stop and say, how do we pray? So I, I think if we picture 30,000-plus people living in tents who can't go to, back to their houses, we can kind of get an idea of how to pray. But how would you encourage us to pray for CAR and, and for believers there? Yeah, I, I would pray. When, when you're talking about 10 years of basically civil war and even— more years of conflict, conflict before that. One, I think you get hardened to some of those experiences where suffering is almost expected, right? And the ch the church is definitely at that point. Two, it, it when you don't have a lot of support, your enemies that are constantly attacking. I I, I would just I would just encourage us to pray for the church. Uh, to to be a bold witness um, to those around them, even within the Muslim community, and I think that is happening in a lot of places in the country. But um, just to continue uh, praying for their enemies, um, being a witness to those who are attacking them time and time again, uh, because ultimately it's the hope of Christ, the light of Christ, which in this world is His church, His bride, that's going to alter the course of the country and, and bring hope to the country and peace, ultimately. So, Amen. 
I want to encourage you to pray for the Central African Republic, to pray for uh, God's work and God's people in Africa. Uh, Sean, I'm going to shift over to you, and let's let's talk a little bit about your part of, of Africa. A uh, couple of very significant countries in terms of attacks, in terms of persecution, in terms of what VOM is doing. Let's start with Ethiopia, because um, I know, as we've talked even in the last few weeks, that's now one of our largest one of our largest fields mm-hmm. in terms of persecution response. Mm-hmm. What's happening in Ethiopia for believers in Jesus? Well, let, let, let's start and just say kind of what's been happening over the last couple of years, and that's that's been a uh, you know we we did a special report on this uh, as from our uh, from our magazine standpoint. Really, Christians being persecuted on three different fronts. Uh, in the north, that's happening mainly from Ethiopian Orthodox. In the west, from Somali Muslims, and then in the in the south, from Oromo Muslims. So, so we've been responding to those attacks, and and they've been significant, especially um, Islamic extremists in the area as they've infiltrated. But in the midst of all that, a war started uh, last year, um, where the the region of Tigray was in a conflict with the federal government. That conflict has been protracted for a year. There's been two million people displaced, half a million people on the verge of famine, and um, and it looked like that war might end quickly. It didn't. Um, the the TPLF, which is the Tigray People's Liberation Front, regrouped, began advancing south, and made it within a couple of hundred kilometers of uh, Addis Ababa, the capital. And so I was supposed to be in Ethiopia in November. We were hoping to go look at some of our uh, responses, our persecution responses, uh, north of the capital, and it became obvious very quickly that we weren't going to get there because the TPLF had already moved into those areas. And then eventually um, it looked like the capital city was going to fall itself. And so our, our folks on the ground, just it was, it was too chaotic for us to be able to come in and get everybody together. And so that trip was canceled. And then now um, just this week, we, we hear that the TPLF has now retreated back to the Tigray region, um, are, are looking for peace negotiations. And so that's in some ways an encouraging development because it just, there, there's no, there's no good ending right. to this, this conflict. And, uh, but it's so hard for us to respond to persecution and do what we're doing in the country when you have a, a protracted conflict like this. And so is there an, and and I don't want to go too far down the the geopolitics mm-hmm. road, but but is there a religious aspect to the war, the the Tigray people versus the government, or that's really is not religious in nature, but persecution is sort of happening in the background of it, or or kind of how does persecution play? Yeah, into I, I would I would separate the persecution out from from the conflict. Now we have heard stories of of even you know churches being destroyed um, by rebel groups and things like that. But I, I would I would keep those distinct. But it's 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 a situation where responding to persecution becomes more difficult right. because of the war. Everything so unstable. A war but... creates instability, security vacuums, things like that that allow bad actors and persecutors to to do their thing, uh, kind of unchecked. And then and then sometimes it's just hard for us to get information. You know, a lot of times when the TPLF takes over a place or. It just goes dark, and then right. even even our guys on the ground, it's hard to communicate and know what's going on. And so, um, I mean, I just just give a real uh, um, thank you to our guys on the ground who are executing projects because it's been amazing what we've been able to do this year in the middle of a war. And uh, I mean, these are very complex uh, responses that we're doing in the country to persecution, but now they're having to carry those out uh, with hyperinflation and lack of communication and internet going down, all of those kinds of right. things that create new challenges. And so our guys have just done a, a fantastic job of continuing to, you know, to, to minister to the body of Christ in a very difficult situation. But we're hopeful that, that maybe there, there is peace um, and that you know, this next year, from that standpoint, from what's going on in the war, things calm down. And that, that there, there can be healing for the church as well. I mean, that's something I, I think I've mentioned on the podcast before and something that's very um, is very troublesome to us is the potential that this could split the church in right. Ethiopia. And as you know, you know persecution, while horrible in many instances, is 
it unifies the church. It has a galvanizing effect on the church. But when you're talking about something that's political and ethnic and geographical, and you're forced to take sides, it it can it can split the church. And that's something that's just that we've been worried about, and and we've seen that in our in our own country. You know, 150 right. years, we're we're still healing from wounds of a civil war. And we have several denominations in this country that are the result of the church splitting 150 years ago. And so it's that that's what concerns us, really. Yeah. And so um, looking for the church to stay unified. Yeah. Give us an idea of what, like, you talked about big attacks. Mm-hmm. What does that look like? I mean, what happens on the ground that, like, an entire village is attacked? Yeah. What, how does that uh, some of the larger attacks, what we're seeing is that you you have uh, radicalized Islamic groups, not official groups, but just villagers, townspeople, where they come in, they they have been targeting Christians, and these have been systematic. They've th- their goal is to drive them out, and the way they do that is they usually destroy the church, they usually destroy uh, the Christians' home, and then they destroy the Christians' business. And so just take any opportunity out for them to stay there. They don't have a church to go to anymore. They don't have a way to make a living. They don't have a home to stay in. And so— So the goal is not necessarily to kill all the Christians. It's just simply to make it unlivable for them so that they go somewhere else. Oftentimes Christians are killed in the attacks, but even if they're not, their ability to stay there and to have a livelihood and a presence becomes very difficult. And so, you know, our response is always immediately meeting those— there's emergency needs, um, and so we kind of approach it in a phased aspect where we're, we're meeting the emergency needs, but then we try to help them get back, to rebuild their homes, to rebuild their churches, to rebuild their businesses, and that's who we are as VOM, is helping rebuild their Christian witness so they can stay in those areas and continue to minister to their persecutors. Amen. So as it relates to prayer, and you've mm-hmm. talked about some things, so the unity in the church, the, the peace process, mm-hmm. how can we pray for Ethiopia? Yeah, absolutely. Those are the, the two foremost, right? Um, pray for the unity of the church and that they would just be united in, in, in the Holy Spirit and the bond of peace. You know, do pray for the whatever peace talks are coming, you know, that this would really be able— that there's just a lot of wounds, a lot of hurt, a lot of atrocities that have happened on both sides, and that's going to that's gonna take something supernatural right. just to, to heal the wounds of the nation of Ethiopia. And so be praying for that country and be praying for the peace of that country. And then, um, you know, just the future of the church. I pray that the church can really show the love of Jesus Christ. They can show what it means to forgive because you have been forgiven. They can show what, you know, that there is a God who died on a cross to reconcile us to himself, that even when we were sinners, when we didn't deserve any of this, he did that. And um, and that the, the nation can really uh, have a church that's prophetic in the gospel that can be there for this healing and reconciliation process. Amen. That's Sean Patton helping us know how to pray for the nation of Ethiopia. Earlier in the program, Jeremy Malkin told us how we can be praying for the Central African Republic. Sean and Jeremy serve persecuted Christians in Africa on behalf of the Voice of the Martyrs. Both Sean and Jeremy have been on our program before, telling us stories about some of what they have witnessed in Africa and in other parts of the world. To hear those episodes, you should visit the archives at vomradio.net or find VOM Radio wherever you listen to podcasts. And to stay up to date with more reports, like the ones we hear every week here on VOM Radio, I hope you'll subscribe to the free Voice of the Martyrs magazine. In the pages of the magazine, you'll get to travel around the world and get to know your brothers and sisters in Christ and learn how to pray for them and stand with them. To get the free Voice of the Martyrs magazine, again, visit our website, vomradio.net. Click on the link at the top of the page that says Free Magazine. Next week, we're going to finish our conversation with Sean and Jeremy. You know, there's so much happening with the church on the continent of Africa, including the persecution of our brothers and sisters there, that we just couldn't fit all of it into one episode. 
So be sure that you're back to hear the rest of our conversation. That's next week, right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.